Good morning, everyone. Ray, thank you for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And thank you to Furniture Today and Progressive for having me here. It is, uh, it's my privilege to make this presentation. I met a number of you uh, last night. I'm looking forward to meeting more of you today. I have represented your industry for over a decade. It's a wonderful industry, and it's my pleasure to share the information I have on Prop 65 with you. So let's get started because we have a lot to cover. Uh, I have put together a very ambitious agenda. These are questions that I get asked a lot. I suspect these are questions that you get asked a lot from your consumers and your business associates. So I thought what we would do today is try to get at some of the answers uh, to really allow you to master the mandate. And for those of you like me who like to cook, this is gonna be a little bit like peeling an onion. We really do need to strip back the layers to get at what is the heart of Proposition 65. So let's start with a very basic question. What is Prop 65? Proposition 65 or Prop 65 for short. Proposition 65, what it is and what it is not is very confusing. A Canadian newspaper on Monday in writing about a product made by an industry not yours, um, and a chemical, uh, the chemical involved was lead, was talking about, among other things, the safe harbor limit for providing a lead warning under Proposition 65. And the newspaper article said, quote, that the uh, safe harbor limit was, quote, the limit deemed safe for pregnant and lactating women by Proposition 65, end quote. But that's not right, it's not. Prop 65 is not a law that labels products as safe or unsafe, and it is not a law that prohibits products to be sold. Proposition 65 is not a personal injury law. Proposition 65 is a disclosure law. It falls under the broad umbrella of laws that are known as right-to-know laws. They're called right-to-know laws, giving consumers a right to know what's in a product. Proposition 65 as it relates to consumer products, is a notice law. Okay, so a notice of what? Um, a notice of the presence of an exposure to chemicals known to California to cause cancer or reproductive toxicity. Not a notice that there's a risk of harm in using the product. Not a notice that the product is harmful. But notice of the presence of an exposure to a carcinogen or reproductive toxicant. Okay, so let's peel back another layer. What does that mean? Under Proposition 65, do you need to give notice if there is a harm? Are you giving notice if there is a trace amount? Well, neither of those is true. It's not notice that there's an exposure that's harmful. It's not notice that there's exposure to a trace amount. It is notice that there is an exposure for a carcinogen. A notice is required unless there is no significant risk of cancer, assuming lifetime exposure at the level in question. That was totally self-explanatory, right? Uh, that means a one, there is no significant risk of cancer, according to California, if there is one excess cancer in 100,000 people assume, assuming 70 years of exposure to the chemical at the level in question. So a one in 100,000 uh, risk of cancer is not a significant exposure, but a two in 100,000 risk of cancer is. For, observer, for reproductive toxicants, a warning is required unless there is no observable effect on, reproductive, on reproduction at 1,000 times the level of the chemical in question. So a warning is required at 1 1,000th of the level that causes reproductive, a reproductive effect. By definition, therefore, a notice is required for exposures at levels that do not cause harm. So you might be asking yourself, why do we have a law like this? Where did this come from? Well, it came from California. 
And you may not know this, but in California, anybody can write a law, truly. You, anyone can write a law, and if you get enough people to sign a petition, then your law gets to go on the ballot. And the general public gets to vote on whether or not it becomes a law. That is actually the way our state works. Um, for our general election in November 2012, there were 11 propositions on the ballot, and five passed. And that's pretty typical. Every general election, we have numerous laws that were written, um, not by the legislature, um, that are on our ballot, and the general public votes them into law on an up or down vote. And they are given very sexy titles. Proposition 65 was called Restrictions on Toxic Discharges into Drinking Water, Requirement of Notice of Person's Exposure to Toxins. Now, who went around the state of California saying, but I want toxic discharges into drinking water? You could see how this goes. The arguments in favor of Proposition 65 on the ballot said things like, keep these chemicals out of our drinking water. Warn us before we're exposed to any of these dangerous chemicals. And not surprisingly, Proposition 65 was overwhelmingly passed by, with 63% of the vote. And when it became law, it was codified in our Health and Safety Code, and it was called the Safe Drinking Water and Toxic Enforcement Act of 1986. And you can see there really was quite a heavy focus on the drinking water portion of it. And the very first section of the law, which is 25249.5, is actually a prohibition. It is a prohibition on discharging toxic chemicals directly or indirectly into drinking water. You just can't do it. There is not a lot of law on that section. There's not a lot of law under Proposition 65 on that section. Prohibitions of toxic chemicals into drinking water are well regulated, well litigated, and there's not a lot left for discussion. The second section of Proposition, Proposition 65 is the one that you're all interested in. That's the section that applies to exposures. That's the section that says no person in the course of doing business shall knowingly and intentionally expose any individual to chemicals known to the state to cause cancer or reproductive toxicity without first giving a clear and reasonable warning. And that is where all the litigation happens. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that section, that long paragraph, 25249.6, and just so you know, you can get a copy of this PowerPoint presentation from your uh, conference leaders from Furniture Today, and then you'll have all these references in it. We're going to break that down so that we can walk through it and understand exactly what it means. And to my mind, it, that law has seven key factors, and all seven need to be present for a Prop 65 violation. You need to have a person in the course of doing business who knowingly and intentionally exposes an individual to a chemical known to the state to cause cancer or reproductive toxicity without providing a clear and reasonable warning. Let's start at the top. What is a person under Proposition 65? A person is any business entity or individual with 10 or more employees. And for Prop 65 purposes, employees is a human body count. It's not a full-time equivalent count. In the course of doing business is very broadly defined, um, and it extends to out-of-state manufacturers, distributors, um, who ship products into California or otherwise avail themselves of the California market. Knowingly. This does not mean what you might think it might mean. Knowingly does not mean that you know you were violating Proposition 65. Knowingly does not mean that you knew that the chemical was listed under Proposition 65. Knowingly does not even mean that you knew Proposition 65 existed. Knowingly means that you knew or reasonably should have known that an exposure to a chemical that happens to be listed uh, occurs through ordinary use of the product. Intentionally doesn't get you much farther. It really doesn't add much. While it's not expressly defined, 
um, under Prop 65, the act which leads to the exposure has to be intended. So really caused by reasonable um, and foreseeable consumer use and not an accidental exposure. Expose means to cause to ingest, inhale, contact via body surfaces or otherwise come into contact with. Expose covers a lot of things. You may not even realize um, how broadly this uh, term has been interpreted. For example, phthalates, which are DEHP, which is uh, known to exist in some vinyls. The allegation on the plaintiff's side in Prop 65 is that when you touch the vinyl furniture or the vinyl purse or the vinyl belt or the vinyl shoes, the phthalates leach onto your hand and then when you eat, either you ingest the phthalates because of hand to food to mouth contact or directly through hand to mouth contact so that there is, a, there is actually an ingestion of the phthalates. There is an exposure to, to phthalates via in, ingestion even when the phthalates are contained in clearly non-food products. Any individual is someone in California. This is really important. Proposition 65 cannot apply outside um, the borders of California. Now it may not be practical to label or manage or regulate your products on a state-by-state -state basis or a California versus the rest of the world basis. But as, cal as powerful as California is legally, it cannot pass laws that apply outside its borders. Chemical known to the state to cause cancer or reproductive toxicity. Um, I would list them for you, but there are too many. There are now um, over 900 chemicals known to the state to cause cancer or reproductive toxicity. The statute and more specifically the regulations spell out the scientific bodies that have to follow certain scientific protocols to get chemicals listed. Uh, that is well outside the scope of this presentation. Science was not my strong suit, but there are scientific experts out there on Proposition 65 that focus on exposure assessments. What I can tell you is that the list is updated often. New chemicals are added every year. The warning duty becomes effective one year after the chemical is listed. And occasionally, chemicals are delisted. All right, what, step seven. This is the last step in what constitutes Proposition 65, a clear and reasonable warning. Well, what's that? The regulations provide safe harbor warnings. That is, these are warnings that are deemed clear and reasonable. For a carcinogen, the safe harbor warning is warning this product contains a chemical known to the state to cause cancer. For reproductive toxicants, the safe harbor warning is warning this product contains a chemical known to cause reproductive toxicity or birth defects. You can, although not specifically in the regulations, it is generally recognized that it is also safe, a safe harbor, to combine the warnings. So warning this product contains chemicals known to cause cancer um, and birth defects or other reproductive harm. There are a number of chemicals that are listed on both lists, the carcinogenic list and the reproductive toxicant list, and so this makes sense um, in some circumstances. Notably, between cancer and birth defects, there's an and. Not only is it not the safe harbor to say cancer, comma, birth defects, or other reproductive harm, it is um, deemed to be misleading, and a public and private prosecutor um, will not, not only won't accept it as the safe harbor, but will challenge it if there is a cancer or birth defects or other reproductive harm or cancer comma birth defects or other reproductive harm because it's not clear to the consumer whether the chemical is a carcinogen or a reproductive toxicant. Okay, so Law 101, we've worked through what our statute, uh, we've worked through what our statute says. We know where it came from. We know what it is. Let's talk about how it really works in practice, and let's jump to the heart of the matter. How does it get enforced? How do you get sued under Proposition 65? Who can enforce it? 
unlike a number of laws and regulations that you may be familiar with, there is no governmental body, regulatory agency that enforces Proposition 65. Proposition 65 is enforced exclusively through litigation. And that is why there is so much of it. It is the exclusive enforcement mechanism. There is a regulatory body, OEHA, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessments, which publishes the list and maintains the list, but it neither carries out nor has the authority nor the staff nor the duties to carry out enforcement of Proposition 65. It does not monitor the marketplace. It does not monitor warning language. It publishes the list. The enforcement is left to the prosecuting entities in the state, the attorney general, the district attorneys, and the city attorneys. And because the attorney generals, the district attorneys, and the city attorneys have a lot on their plates, Proposition 65 also allows anybody else to file a Proposition 65 lawsuit. It's known as a private attorney general statute. It turns private citizens into mini attorney generals suing in the public interest if they meet certain conditions. Okay, so what does that mean? What does it mean for a person to sue in the public interest? And what are the conditions that they have to meet? Well, a, pub, a private attorney general suing in the public interest means that Proposition 65 does not have any of the traditional standing requirements. In most, under most laws, the plaintiff, the private plaintiff filing the lawsuit has to be harmed in some way. Not necessarily physical harm or personal injury. Could be economic harm. In Prop 65, the plaintiff doesn't have to say, I bought this product and if I knew that it contained a chemical known to cause cancer or reproductive toxicity, I wouldn't have bought it. The private plaintiff doesn't have to say that. In Prop 65, the private plaintiff doesn't have to say, I bought this product because it didn't have a Prop 65 warning. And if I knew that it was going to have a Prop 65 warning or should have had a Prop 65 warning, I wouldn't have paid so much for it. I paid more for that because it didn't have the warning. Prop 65 doesn't require that. There is no harm requirement. There's no reliance requirement. There are none of those traditional safeguards that ensure that the plaintiff bringing the lawsuit has a, a vested interest or, or a reason for bringing the lawsuit. In the world of Proposition 65, anyone can bring a Prop 65 lawsuit if they send a notice of intent to sue letter 60 days before filing the lawsuit, and if, in that time, no public prosecutor begins diligently prosecuting. That's it. And those procedural safeguards, those conditions really aren't there for your benefit. They're there for the benefit of the pu public prosecutors. It gives the public, the public prosecutors can then rely on the private plaintiffs to go out and find the violations and send the notice letters and then they get 60 days to review them and decide whether they want to take over whether they think it's something that they want to get involved in prosecuting and if they don't then the private plaintiff can proceed all right so what is a 60-day notice letter some of you have received one of these it must include a summary of proposition 65 the name and contact information for the noticing party, which is often the plaintiff's attorney, the name of the alleged violator, the approximate time period during which the violation allegedly occurred, the name of each listed chemical at issue, the route of exposure, inhalation, ingestion, dermal, often all three are listed. As I explained, they're very broadly interpreted. And the name of the consumer product or type of consumer product. And the 60-day notice letter needs to include a certificate of merit. That's new, or at least newish, in the world of Proposition 65. That wasn't there when the law was passed in 1986. That was added in one of only two substantive um, reforms of Prop 65. This was added about a decade or so ago. This requires a statement to be included with the certificate of merit that says that the enforcer has consulted with someone that has relevant expertise, that that expert has reviewed facts and studies and data regarding the exposure to the chemical at issue, and that based on that consultation, the enforcer believes, reasonably believes that there is merit to the case. Before that certificate of merit was there, 
the only requirement for a plaintiff bringing a Prop 65 case was the 60-day notice letter that lists the name, their name, your name, the chemical, the product, the route of exposure. They didn't have to actually do anything to know that there was an exposure. So you often saw waves of litigation where because one chemical, there was an exposure to a chemical found in one product made by one company, notice letters were then issued to other companies for similar products, even if no work had been done to determine whether or not there was an exposure to a chemical um, in a product from that company. This reform was intended to impose a modest hurdle to plaintiffs. And I intentionally say it's a modest hurdle because it has not done much. And that's because the backup that's required for the Certificate of Merit, oops, we lost our backup, there it is. The name of the person consulted, the explanation as to why that person is an expert, the fact studies and data that were actually reviewed, none of that goes to you, the regulated community. Not only does none of it go to you, you cannot ever get it, not ever. That goes to the Attorney General, and it is maintained in confidence by the Attorney General. It is for their benefit, and their benefit alone. Okay, so who's the regulated community? Prop 65 doesn't just apply to manufacturers. It applies to everyone in a chain of distribution. Everyone has an independent duty to warn. That said, the law does say that to the extent practical, warnings should be uh, provided by a manufacturer as opposed to um, a retailer, unless the retailer is responsible for introducing the chemical into the consumer product. So Prop 65 casts a broad, um, a broad net. Now the warning text, how does the warning text work in practice? Um, the safe harbor warning is frequently used in practice and that is what we see the most, uh, that's what we see mostly in California. And we see it a lot in California. Um, it is worth noting that in California these warnings have become so ubiquitous. They're in our coffee shops, they're in our fast food restaurants, they're in, um, they're in our, our fish counters. They're at the you know delivery the, the delivery guy uh, loading dock. They are uh, they are everywhere because chemicals are everywhere. And in California, we're a little bit immune to it. But I appreciate that outside of California, where uh, where the consumer who emailed Ray lives in Chicago, uh, they are they are more startling because they are not as prevalent. But in C California, they're everywhere and they are frequently the safe harbor warning. That said, um, the law provides a number of variations to the safe harbor warning. First, you could say using this product will expose you to chemicals known to the state to cause cancer or reproductive toxicity. You could even say using this product may expose you to chemicals known to the state to cause cancer or reproductive toxicity. Because under Prop 65, the only thing that is known is that the chemical is on a list of chemicals known to cause cancer or reproductive toxicity. You can even delete the reference to state of California if you wish. Um, and you could deviate beyond this. The only requirement is that the warning must clearly communicate that the chemical in question is known to cause cancer, birth defects, or other reproductive harm. This is the warning that we see in our coffee shops. This is what we call a contextual warning. There are also warnings like this at the fast food restaurants. Both of those involve acrylamide. And you'll see that what those companies and those industries decided to do is they have this long paragraph that sort of explains why they're giving the warning, what, where the warning comes from, what the warning means, and what the warning um, doesn't mean. And it's on a little plaque somewhere nearish the, um, nearish the point of sale. And if you go through uh, the state and you ask people who work there, you know, how many questions do you get about that plaque? Or you ask people who frequent these locations, how many questions, you know, have you ever asked a question about that plaque? You'd be surprised at how um, little attention it raised in California simply because of the ubiquitousness of the, um, of the warnings. But this is another way to go, a contextual warning. It takes up more space. It generally can't be on your product because of the space it requires, um, but it can, be, it can be posted in a store. 
things to consider about when um, formulating a warning and placing a warning is that it needs to be placed prominently. It needs to be conspicuous as compared to other words, statements, designs, and devices in the labeling or display. Generally, that means if there is other warning language on your product, it needs to be in the same font as that other warning language. It needs to be in the same color as that warning, other warning language. It needs to be generally in the same area as that other warning language. Likely to be read and understood by an ordinary uh, customer under customary conditions of purchase or use. Proposition 65 is not about the margins. It's not about uh, the, the extraordinary user. It's about the average user doing average things with the products. Warnings can be placed in a lot of different places, on a product label or a sticker on, your pro on a product label. Some companies can't run different product labels for California versus the rest of the country, so they put stickers on the products going to California. On, exter on the external packaging or a sticker on the external packaging, a hang tag on the product on the sales floor, a retail store shelf sign, signs at the point of sale or store entrance, the symbol system is not, as prevalent, is not as prevalent. The symbol system definitely exists in California. Um, it is, uh, there's a lot more manpower involved in it, so it is, um, and it is a little bit more, um, uh, more labor intensive to carry out, but it does exist. What it means is that there's a yellow triangle, and inside the yellow triangle is a black exclamation point and you put the yellow triangle with the black exclamation point on all the products for which you want to give a Prop 65 warning. And then at the point of sale, you have a sign with the yellow triangle and the black exclamation point and text that explains how, why you have that yellow triangle with the black exclamation point and what it relates to and why it relates to it, and that's where you give your Prop 65 warning. For mail shipments, warnings can be placed on the invoice, package insert, a catalog page. Uh, some of these are more uh, looked upon more favorably than others by prosecutors. A warning that you can only see after, after you've purchased the product is generally um, less uh, looked on less favorably than a warning that you could see before you purchase the product. Although notably, Prop 65 is not an economic harm statute. So the requirement is that the warning be given before exposure, not before purchase. Um, one way around that is often with you know, generous return policies. For internet sales, um, on-screen warnings that are embedded on the page where a product appears are tricky, right? Because that means everyone across the country or across the world who pulls up that product is going to see that warning on that product page. Um, an alternative that a number of companies do is it, they have it show up in a pop-up window. So if the purchaser types in a California zip code as the mailing address, then a pop-up window appears with the Prop 65 warning. Okay, so we've, now we've walked through sort of how Prop 65 somewhat works in practice. How are, how are other companies and other industries carrying it out? Let's talk about what happens in Proposition, in proposition 65 lawsuits. Let's see how this all plays out. Okay, like all cases, there are two burdens um, in, in a case. Two, there are two sides. Each side has a burden of proof, and that is supposed to work as a mitigating factor. A plaintiff has to carry their burden of proof, of proving their case, of proving that the other side did something wrong. And then and only then does the burden then shift to the defendant to either prove that they didn't do something wrong, that the plaintiff is just wrong, or to prove that they are allowed to do what they do, that there's an exception, there's an affirmative defense that allows them to do what they do. In Proposition 65, the plaintiff's burden is very light. And so it has the effect of shifting the burden, and therefore the cost, and therefore the risk, to the defendant very quickly and very easily. In Prop 65, the plaintiff has a burden of proving that the defendant has more than 10 employees, that the products were sold in California, that uh, when the product is used in a reasonable and intended manner, the user will come into contact with the listed chemical, that the defendant knew or reasonably should have known 
that the user would come into contact with the chemical through ordinary use and that no clear and reasonable warning was given before exposure. And that's it. The plaintiff does not have to prove that the exposure is at a harmful level. The plaintiff does not even have to prove that the exposure is above the safe harbor level for which a warning is required if OEHA has set a safe harbor level. This is all that the plaintiff has to show. The burden then shifts the defendant to show that the exposure was below the safe harbor level. For TDCPP, that's 5.4 micrograms per day. So a plaintiff doesn't have to show that there's an exposure above 5.4 micrograms per day. They just have to show there was an exposure. And then the defendant has to show that the exposure was below 5.4 micrograms per day. Or that the exposure poses no significant risk. When OEHA sets the safe harbor numbers, for which warnings are the threshold warning requirements. That's exactly what they are. They're safe harbor no numbers. And OEHA and nothing in Prop 65 prevents a defendant from proving that some other level is actually the no significant risk level or the no observable effect level for a reproductive toxicant. The defendant would bear the burden of proving preemption. It has never been, almost never been successfully done. It is very hard to prove and not something to hang your hat on or to prove that the exposure took place less than, less than 12 months after a chemical was listed. That, again, is the defendant's burden. The defendant could also try to disprove the elements of plaintiff's case. The defendant could try to disprove that there was an exposure at all, or disprove that there was no clear and reasonable warning, or disprove that there was no knowing and intentional violation. This places a disproportionate burden on the defendant, and defendants um, uh, generally carry the heavier burden in Proposition 65. And it's a burden for which at the end of the road there are fairly s stiff possible remedies. The first would be injunctive relief. That's a court order that requires that a warning be provided in certain circumstances. There are reasonable civil penalties. Under the statute, reasonable civil penalties can't exceed $2,500 per day per violation. 75% of that money goes to the state, the Department of Toxic Substances Control, and 25% of it goes to the plaintiff. So they get paid for bringing the lawsuit. There can be Cypre payments in lieu of penalties. That's instead of giving the money to the state, a defendant gives the money to a public interest organization that spends the money on addressing the public harm alleged, and the plaintiff's lawyer can recover reasonable attorney's fees. Again, this obliterates another moderating force in litigation. Under the traditional American rule, each side bears its own fees in litigation. And it moderates litigation because each side has to decide whether it's worth incurring those fees to bring the lawsuit. Is there really merit here? Are we really going to win? Because we're going to have to pay our lawyers regardless of whether we win or not. And in Prop 65, that's taken away because the plaintiff's lawyer can recover um, his or her attorney's face. These are the factors that a court is supposed to consider in setting reasonable, penalty, reasonable penalties. And that means that these are the areas into which a plaintiff can take discovery. And discovery is arguably the most time, consent, time intensive, burdensome, and expensive part of any litigation. And because of that, most Prop 65 cases settle. Because of this, because of the discovery, and because of the burden shifting, most Prop 65 cases settle. A judge recently said to me that 90% of all cases settle, but 98% of Prop 65 cases settle. And that is because of the uh, weakening of the mitigating factors that would normally uh, normalize um, litigation before it is brought. In Prop 65, there's no such thing as a confidential settlement. In general, all settlements must be court approved. And all settlements, regardless of whether or not they're court approved, have to be submitted to the Attorney General. So there's no such thing as a confidential settlement. They all become public. To get court approval of a settlement, plaintiff bears the, warning of sh the burden of showing that the warning required in the settlement complies with the law and that the civil penalties and attorney's fees are reasonable. Timing is important. There's also no such thing as a quick settlement under Proposition 65. 
Not only do all settlements have to be court approved, but they all have to go to the and they all have to go to the attorney general first, and the attorney general gets 45 days to review and comment on the settlement. So the attorney general could come in at the notice letter stage and take over a matter and prosecute it, or it could pass and let the private private plaintiff litigate it. And then when the settlement is reached and the settlement gets submitted to the attorney general, then the attorney general can review the settlement and decide whether it likes it or not, whether it wants it changed, how it wants it changed, whether it's going to object, and what it's going to object on. And then there has to be a notice motion and a hearing before the court. In a typical Proposition 65 litigation, there there is a wave of notice letters. A wave is not atypical, a wave is typical. That's because notwithstanding the certificate of merit requirement that got added to the 60-day notice um, threshold, in general, plaintiffs are able to take advantage of economies of scale. If they find an exposure to a listed chemical in a product, they will then go out and get gather products buy products um, from other companies in the same industry looking for the same chemical and more often than not they will find it because there's a reason why the chemical was there in the first place. There is a relatively small handful of plaintiffs and plaintiffs lawyers that bring the vast majority of Proposition 65 litigation. They tend to be these notice layers and these lawsuits against multiple companies for the same type of evaluation tend to get related before the same judge. And more often than not, that's one of the two complex judges in San Francisco or the, one of the two complex judges in Alameda. Some cases get filed elsewhere. There's cases in LA, there's cases in Orange County, there's cases in Humboldt County. But by and large, we're up north and we're in San Francisco and Alameda before one of four judges that hears a lot of Prop 65 uh, cases. And generally, there's a relatively small uh, number of defense lawyers that are defending these types of cases. Companies get together and they hire joint representation for cost sharing and then all the defense counsel get together or some large number of them get together and form a joint defense group which does result in some additional cost savings. There is some advantage to it being a relatively close-knit group where everybody knows each other. Lest you feel picked on, the furniture industry is not the only industry that has seen a major industry-wide enforcement wave. Lots of industries have gone through what you are going through. Lots of industries have seen um, a lot of notice letters, but if we focus on the furniture, current furniture industry litigation on TRIS, you'll see how one, of the, one, one way in which a wave gets started is this way. A new chemical was added to the list. And you could see how quickly this escalated. It was the end of October in 2011 when TRIS was added to the Prop 65 list of chemicals. One year later, the warning obligation became effective. And within a month, the first notice letter was issued. And within three months of that, the first lawsuit was issued. At the time I prepared that this slide, the latest lawsuit had been filed on November 5. There are currently 213 lawsuits. And the latest notice issue, letter had been issued on November 15. And at that time, there were 257 notice letters issued. There are other ways enforcement waves get started. There could be studies, a governmental or a non-governmental study, about the presence of chemicals in a type of product. And um, often those studies may be about whether or not the presence of the chemical is harmful. And interestingly enough, even if the study concludes the, the chemical is not harmful, the study may have found that there was the levels of the chemical in the product, though far below the harmful level, were above the Prop 65 safe harbor level for triggering a warning. Because as we talked about, those warning trigger levels are not set based on harm. They are set based on no harm. They are levels at which there is no harm. And so there was an enforcement wave on this last slide. I told you there was a wave against the vitamin and dietary vitamin industry. And that was started because of an FDA study that looked at lead in um, children's vitamins and prenatal vitamins. It found that 
there was lead in the vitamins. There's lead in most things that grow in the ground that come from minerals and plants and things like that. But that the levels of lead weren't harmful. They were well below the FDA's tolerable intake levels for lead. But they were above the Prop 65 safe harbor threshold of 0.5 micrograms per day, and an enforcement wave was born. Product recalls can start a Prop 65 enforcement wave. When someone found out that the Thomas the Tank Engine toys from China had been painted with lead-based paint, more toys were bought by plaintiff's lawyers than you could possibly imagine, and thus an enforcement wave was born. Some enforcement waves are long-standing and ongoing, and the plaintiff's lawyers are just working their way through the industries. That's the case with phthalates, with DEHP. They started with handbags, and they went to belts, and they went to shoes, and now they're on furniture, and they'll just simply keep working their way through industries that use vinyl. And some industries are just saddled with constant and nonstop Prop 65 litigation because of the nature of their products. I talked about lead. Um, lead is ubiquitous. It is everywhere in nature, which means it's in everything that grows or lives in the environment, including you and me. Um, so the food industry is um, uh, saddled with near constant Prop 65 litigation. I don't know why it keeps doing that. Okay, um, 18,000 notice letters. That's a lot. Um, over the history of Proposition 65, 18,000 notice letters have been issued. Uh, we are on par for a record year this year. I think we went over 1,100 notice letters in 2011. I expect that we will get close to that um, this year as well. But there haven't been anything close to 18,000 trials because most Prop 65 cases, as we talked about, settled. So let's look at what a settlement might look like. In 2012, there were 437 settlements, and 397 of those were private plaintiff settlements. We talked about how the majority of litigation is brought by the private prosecutors. 14 plaintiffs are responsible for those 397 settlements. We also talked about how there's a relatively small universe of plaintiffs that bring the vast majority of the Prop 65 lawsuits. The biggest chunk of the money goes to the attorney's fees. And you can see the range there of the, of the settlements. They've ranged uh, from five to $757,000 in 2012. A couple takeaways from here. One, if you compare 2012 to 2000, you'll see that the size of the settlements hasn't changed all that much. There were about half as many settlements in 2000 as 2012, but the total value of the settlements was also about half. That's because same plaintiff's lawyers, same defense lawyers, same judges, it is a, is a tight-knit group, and because you're talking about a law that is enforced exclusively through regulation, those prior consent judgments, the consent judgments that came before, really form the precedent that people um, that people work from and that people operate within. You could also see the range of the settlements. Large million dollar or close to million dollar settlements are rare. Most, most settlements are in a much smaller range. Um, there may be one or two settlements missing off these next couple slides, but this is all or nearly all of the million dollar settlements um, in the history of Proposition 65 and the near million dollar settlements um, in the history of Proposition 65. Okay, so I, I would like to, to leave you with some, some useful tips, some information that you could take away from here to really help you master the mandate of Proposition 65. And the first thing I want you to remember is don't ignore the notice letter. It's true, it's not really there for your benefit. There are other laws that have notice provisions that say, that um, if you comply, if you do something to, to fix this problem within the notice period, uh, you can't be sued or you won't be subject to penalties. That's not Prop 65. Prop 65 is there for the benefit of the public prosecutors, but still don't ignore it. That's 60 days within which someone can't sue you, and you could do a lot in those 60 days. First, you could do your own internal due diligence. You could do your fact finding to figure out what's going on. You could start a dialogue with the plaintiff's lawyer. The vast majority of Prop 65 cases settle. You're going to talk with them sooner rather than later, and talking with them early 
could stave off some of that um, expensive, burdensome, and time-consuming discovery. Um, don't forget your document preservation holds. This is not unique to Proposition 65, but I cannot stand up here as a litigator in good faith and not remind you to get your document holds for electronic and non-electronic information in place immediately. There are really harsh penalties in the law um, if, those, um, if, if documents and information are inadvertently destroyed. Uh, know your judge, know your adversary, know your precedent. It really is a small world. The world of Prop 65 is small. And um, what happens in your case is going to be informed by what came before and what your plaintiff did before and what your judge has approved before. And so you need to know those things. Beware of private settlements. So I said that there's no such thing as a confidential settlement, and I said that most settlements have to be approved by the court. Um, it's nearly correct to say that all settlements have to be approved by the court. You can have a settlement that doesn't get approved by the court. If you do, it means that you get nothing from that settlement other than the fact that that one plaintiff cannot sue you again. That's it. You get a release from that one plaintiff, and that one plaintiff cannot sue you again. This really only makes sense if um, you don't have any other exposure going forward. So, um, you know, the sales team found a great new product that you were going to branch out into, and you, you had a, you, you know, you floated, you floated it as a test in one store, and uh, it turned out it was, you know, painted with uh, paint that contained lead. And you could just pull it off. It's not spread across the country. There's not a lot out there. You had a small sample number that you were floating. You could pull it off, never use it again. You may not need a consent judgment that's approved by the court. Um, or you, uh, it turns out you just had a bad supplier. It's not a problem that's uh, industry-wide or supplier-wide. Um, you know, there's, there are bad fish out there and you just happen to, uh, to buy from a bad fish. You can send all your stock back. You can try to get your money back. You can control your future exposure. Uh, you can get a new supplier and you won't have this product again problem again. Maybe you can get away without a consent judgment. But it is really rare, the circumstance in which um, it's going to make sense for you to pay someone money and get nothing in return. Remember that consent judgments last forever. This is a judgment of the court and it will be with the company for as long as the company exists. So if there are obligations of the consent judgment, you need to work them into your SOPs because long after you're gone and everyone who was at the company at the time of the consent judgment is gone, those obligations will remain. And if the company does not comply with them, the company can be held in contempt of court. So you need to, one, work those obligations into your SOP so they become a part of doing business. And two, be mindful of what you're agreeing to do. It sort of comes back to know your, know your precedent. Um, a lot of, um, companies that have not been hit by Prop 65 before may get a consent judgment from a plaintiff that has really onerous terms um, that the company has no way of knowing are not standard, are not terms that other companies agree to. But the plaintiff knows the company hasn't been hit by Prop 65 before, so it sees what it can get. Um, you know, beware of those terms. Any sort of you know, reporting obligation, if you're going to have a reporting obligation indefinitely, that's going to be nearly impossible to carry off without um, a slip, without a human error or loss of memory slip. Don't assume federal preemption applies um, and there are no secrets. All the notice letters are public. All the notice letters are posted by the Attorney General so everybody knows who has gotten a notice letter. And the Attorney General also posts when a complaint is filed, when there's a settlement, when there's a judgment. So this is all public, and especially now with court files being nearly all online, um, they're also available that way as well. Okay, so this is the point when I was going to look into my crystal ball and give you all the answers, but the airline made me check the crystal ball and then they lost it. So I don't have it today. Um, but what I can tell you um, is that reform is possible and reform happened just very recently, and more reform could be coming. In 2013, we saw legislative reform. 
It was a bill uh, by, the name, by the number of AB 227. Now, as originally drafted, it was very promising. As originally drafted, it really made the notice provision a notice for your benefit because it said that if you receive a notice letter and you correct the violation within 14 days of the notice letter, then there can be no lawsuit and no penalties. So if you get a notice letter and you can get your warnings out there and you can't be sued and you can't be subject to penalties. But Prop 65, as a voter approved initiative, can be approved by the voters on a simple majority but needs a supermajority to be amended by the legislature. It needs a two-thirds vote. And 227 was amended multiple times as it worked its way through the legislature. And where it ended up was not only would there be a relatively de minimis civil penalty, but it was extremely limited. And it is now um, only for the benefit of a few um, industries, a few companies and a few industries, and to um, the circumscribed exposures to food and alcohol and, and engine exhaust at restaurants, bars, and parking lots. Um, because it doesn't really, um, as amended and as passed, um, affect your industry. I'm not going to spend too much time in this on this, but there is an article um, that I wrote that sort of explains it if you really want to know how the amendments work. And uh, Furniture Today will get that to you if you're interested in seeing that. Reform was in the air in 2013, and we also had um, the initiation of some political reform. In May, Governor Brown made a grand proclamation that uh, received quite a lot of attention, and he announced his intention to work with stakeholders to address abusive Prop 65 actions that are not in the public interest. And a huzzah went out across the land, and then very little happened. The governor wanted stakeholders to talk about limiting or capping attorney's fees. We sh I showed you the slide. 69% of the money that is paid in a Prop 65 settlement, on average, goes to the plaintiff's lawyers. And the governor talked about capping or limiting attorney's fees recovery as a way of reining in abusive Prop 65 actions that are not in the public interest. He talked about requiring stronger um, backup for the Certificate of Merit and making it more transparent, making it available to you, the re regulated industry, as a way of moderating the initiation of actions that are abusive and not in the public interest. And he talked about limiting the diversion of civil penalties to non-governmental Cypre funds because those organizations that do good work with the money in the settlement instead of the 75% money going to the state are often tied to the plaintiff who brought the lawsuit in the first place. Meetings were held, discussions were had, and as of right now, those discussions have stalled and nothing has come, has come of it. So in 2014, I expect we will see another year with 900 plus or so notice letters. There are maybe one or two cases out there that are teed up that could have a trial. More likely than not, there will be hundreds of settlements. But I remain hopeful that in the Proposition, Proposition 65 world, reform is possible and that reform efforts can happen. And I'm hopeful because the more industries like yours get together and really talk about Proposition 65 and what it means and what you could do and how you can fix it, the more hopeful I am that reform is a real possibility.